Hello, thanks for listening. This is Professor Ryan Paul, and I'm going to be talking in this lecture about narratives, narrators, uh, and specifically the stories Sunny's Blues and Cask of Amontillado, and talk about um, the first person, the use of first person narrative in these stories, how it shapes our reception of the text, how it is used to advance the plot and create a certain type of story. So let's start with talking about first-person narrative, and there's some overlap here with uh, my previous presentations on narrators. So first-person narratives and first-person narrators, you're experiencing the story from within, from within the story, either as usually one of the main characters or more uh, rarely, more uh, uh, uncommonly, one of the side characters observing the events. But it's a first-person view, and I've used the example of video games before, the first-person shooter, as they're called, where you are looking through the eyes of the person right there in the battle. So it's very immediate. Uh, you're seeing things as they're happening. You're experiencing them um, as they're going on, but you are limited to the perspective and the knowledge uh, of that one person. In a video game, if you're playing in the first-person perspective, you can't see what's behind your character. Whereas if it was, say, a top-down camera that was looking at the whole uh, battlefield, you could see what's in front and behind your character. But when you're in first person, just like you can't see what's behind you in real life, what's behind your head in real life, you can't see what's behind your character. So in a story that's told from a first-person perspective, you can only see what that character sees. You only know what that character knows. So ultimately, first-person narratives are defined by the limitations and the limitation of human experience. You might say then that the first person narrative is a particular way of representing artistically, representing in a text, what we do every day, the, the way we negotiate our experience of being a finite being, of being trapped in our own heads, unable to know and see what other people are thinking and feeling. The first person narrative is a way to explore that human experience uh, and do so through art. Uh, and of course, stories are usually heightened situations. They're usually unusual situations. That's what makes them stories worth telling. They're not just about going to the market to buy milk. So it's about uh, how the limitations that the, of being an individual human being, how our limitations that define us as physical beings um, how they shape the way we perceive and react and act in these unusual, heightened, and uh, often highly symbolic or meaningful situations. Which is all to say we can sum it up as a first-person narrative explores what it's like to be a person, what it's like to be an I, what it's like to be a self. With that in mind, let's jump to talking about Sonny's Blues. And I want to consider in Sonny's Blues how the narrator's perspective and the plot are tied together in uh, important ways. This is, of course, a first-person story, a first-person narrative told from the perspective of uh, a brother whose younger brother is the title character, Sonny, um, and this older brother, uh, his perspective on the relationship of these two throughout their life and in particular, the story is focused on their reconciliation, their attempt to reconcile after years of being separate, years of being divided uh, from one another, years of being alienated from each other. We can say then that it's a story of two brothers splitting apart and then reconciling. So choosing to tell this from the first person rather than a third person perspective talking about Sonny and his brother blank whatever the narrator's name is we never actually learn uh, but Sonny and let's say his name is Robert uh, so the story of Sonny and Robert that would be a very different story by telling it from the first person what Baldwin the author does is he embodies that experience he puts it in the very form of the story the experience of what it's like to be separate from another person. We see things from the narrator's perspective 
because that helps us to understand and experience the narrator's separateness from his brother Sonny all the more powerfully. In the scenes where Sonny and the narrator argue, the narrator doesn't know what Sonny's thinking. All he has to go on is what he sees and what he hears. And he filters that through his, of course, his own experiences and his life. But he doesn't know what's going on in Sonny's head. And so we don't know what's going on in Sonny's head. We feel that frustration, perhaps, of watching the younger brother throw his life away, hurt himself, the desire to help him. We feel, perhaps, also the narrator's confusion over his brother, his inability to understand what his brother wants, to, to relate to his brother's perspective on life. We can experience all the more powerfully the narrator's uh, desire to, to bond with his brother, desire to reconnect. So the first person allows us to see that all the more intimately, whereas if this was from a third person perspective, we would be getting pr probably both what the narrator thinks and what Sonny thinks. So we'd see the narrator, you know, Robert felt frustrated when he saw Sonny doing this. And then we'd also have, and Sonny in his head was thinking blah, 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 right? And it would, um, it could be a good story, but it'd be a very different story. It'd be a totally different story. It wouldn't be about the same thing, even if it was about the same thing, so to speak. So the first person narrative, I think, is crucial to us experiencing along with the narrator this attempt to cross the boundary, to cross the, the barrier, the gulf that exists between him and his brother Sonny. Thus, a couple of questions that we should consider right at the very beginning is in this, this quest to know and reach his brother Sonny, uh, how does the narrator attempt to bridge that gulf? How does he attempt to reach his brother? What are the, the ways, the, the methods, the things he goes through in his attempt to, to get closer to his brother? And what are the obstacles that face him, both internal and external obstacles that face him on that journey? I had you uh, a little while back do an exercise of close reading the first paragraph, uh, first couple paragraphs of this story, because I think these opening paragraphs once more stress the sense of isolation that the narrator feels and they make us feel it to a certain extent, uh, the sense of isolation, the, the sense of frustration, the sense of ignorance, of not understanding. This is the moment when the narrator has just read about Sonny being arrested for heroin, and he's shocked. He doesn't know how to process it. He feels terrible, but he doesn't really, in some sense, understand. He can't comprehend what's going on. And in the way that the paragraph is written, we never, or we don't actually get explanation of what happened or even who Sonny is for a little while, for a few paragraphs in. Instead, in that first paragraph, notice how he keeps saying, I couldn't believe it. I was staring at it. I read about it. So we're told it over and over and over again, but we don't know what it is. So we have also that sense of ignorance right, sense of, of surprise, of lack of understanding, of wanting to understand what's going on, what is making him so upset, right? And just as he can't understand it, we don't understand it. And note also where we're beginning. We don't begin, and think about this story goes through a lot of different time periods, right? It talks about when they were younger. It talks about earlier in their life. But it doesn't start with Sonny and I were born in, you know, two years apart back in 1902 or whatever. There's no, it doesn't start back there. It doesn't start with my father uh, had been a slave but was freed at the Civil War and blah, blah, blah. You know, he doesn't go all the way back. He starts instead right at the moment when he first learned of Sonny's problem. Because in some sense, that's where this part of the story begins. If the story is about them reconnecting, this is the moment where the split between them really becomes obvious to the narrator, where he feels it, and also where he begins the long and, and not always uh, 
uh, not always, uh, uh, he's not always going uphill. He's not always successful in his journey. He begins that long journey trying to reach his brother at that moment. So even though the story goes back later, again, we begin with the narrator at that moment of, oh, my God, my brother's been arrested for heroin. And this is, as I've talked about in uh, other presentations, this is the technique of in media res, in the middle of things. The story begins in the middle of the events that are important to us. And then as we're exploring those events, as we're experiencing those, it goes back and, and gives us the context and gives us the history that we need to understand. But in telling the story, it's not trying to give us a complete history, right? It's telling us a particularly focused story and in the story of the brothers and their disconnect and then reconciliation, that in a sense encompasses their whole family history and the uh, historical context beyond that. So the small story of the narrator and Sonny is a way into a much larger story. Okay, after that beginning, how does the narrator proceed? How does the narrator, what is the narrator's quest? Uh, what is his journey as he tries to uh, uh, connect with, contact, um, and, and re reconcile with his brother Sonny? Now here I'm not going to go in detail of every moment, every scene in the story. Uh, I'll touch on a few moments, but the idea here is to give you an overview, a, a theoretical sort of framework that you can use to read and think about the details of the story. So when the narrator first learns, or after he first learns of Sonny's uh, problems, he immediately looks to the world around him to try to understand. Uh, we notice how he sees in his students, he sees in their faces, the face of a young Sonny. And then he runs into an old friend of Sonny's, and he sees in that old friend Sonny as well. So he sees Sonny in the faces of these people, and, and what is it that he sees in them that reminds him of Sonny? What is it that they communicate to him about Sonny? Or what does he perhaps project on them? What does he imagine that he sees in, th in them that he identifies with Sonny? When Sonny finally arrives in the story um, and, and comes to stay with the narrator, um, they start talking uh, about the past, and the narrator talks about how his past flooded back. Um, and the journey of the narrative now becomes not just a journey uh, going forward in time and a journey of, of him and his brother, the story of him and his brother in the present day, in the present moment, but the journey becomes a journey into their past as well, the past of their childhood and then even beyond that into the past of their family. And it begins with Sonny returning to Harlem where the narrator has in some sense never left from. Harlem is the place of both past and present for them. And we get into their family history, the relationship of their deceased father to Sonny and the conflict between them. And we see the death of the father and in some sense the transfer of the duty of caring for Sonny from father to brother, from uh, the, de the, the dead father to the narrator and the mother at the, they, the narrator remembers the funeral or after the funeral, the mother saying, you need to take care of Sonny. And here is one of many allusions, allusions to biblical stories, the brother that's responsible for the brother. If you know the story of Cain and Abel, Cain becomes jealous of his brother Abel, uh, who is, receives greater praise from God for his sacrifice. And so Cain kills his brother Abel, and uh, uh, when, when God comes and asks him, says, where is my brother, or where is your brother Abel? Cain says, I'm not my brother's keeper. I'm not responsible for him. That's the way Cain tries to deny uh, what he's done. He says, I'm not responsible for what's happened to him. I'm not my brother's keeper. Uh, go ask him. If you're looking for him, go find him yourself. Uh, and that's uh, so that's when Cain fails this test. He fails. Not only does he fail in, in murdering his brother, but he fundamentally fails to understand that he's responsible for his brother and his brother is responsible for him. He fundamentally 
fails to understand that, that they do need each other, that one is one's brother's keeper. So there's an allusion to that here. Um, and it's not just to give the story some sort of weight or, or biblical flavor. Um, I think it's because that's still a problem today, the relationship between brothers, the way families are split because of jealousy, because of anger, because of difference of perspective. So still today, we are trying to explore, we're trying to negotiate how do we care for other people? How do we care for our family? How do we care for our relatives? What are our responsibilities for other people, especially people like Sonny, who hurt themselves over and over and over again? One thing that's common for people who have family members that are drug addicts, like Sonny, is that even when they try to help, they try to help their, their addicted relatives, and the, the addicted relative wants, often does authentically want to get better, but because of the severity of their addiction, that often leads to them relapsing, which can lead to them um, harming, in various ways, uh, their family members that were trying to help them. So how much do you keep, how many times do you try to help a family member that's burned you before? Uh, at what point do you say, I'm no longer responsible? So I think the story is, in some sense, a meditation on that problem, right? On the problem of how do we, how do we understand what we owe to each other? And when we see, learn of the past as the narrator travels into his own past, into his past memory, to explore um, his relationship with Sonny, we go, we get another leap into the past as he remembers how at the funeral, at his father's funeral, his mother had told them about an uncle that they hadn't known, an uncle who had died when before they were born, and how the father had always been angry and traumatized by his brother's death. And the mother tells this story to, to the narrator as a way of, almost as a lesson, in the sense that the father and uncle were are, are kind of a, a set of models for Sonny and the narrator. Models, uh, on the one hand, of brothers who cared for each other because the, the father never got over his brother's death, right? Uh, but also lessons to be learned. Don't let what happened to them happen to you, right? Don't uh, uh, lose your brother. Don't allow your brother to, be, to destroy himself and then suffer like your father did for years, always wondering if you could have done something different, always lamenting the loss. And I think this, this moment, it raises the question of what is our relationship to our past? We can learn from our past. Of course, we can change the past. We can look at things that have done be gone before us and try to learn from them and change from them. But we are also constrained and trapped by the past. The trauma that the narrator and Sonny's father experience it, experienced is replicated in the next generation, right? Um, and if we consider the larger context that I talk about, talked about in another presentation of the um, burgeoning pressure uh, uh, that, that would soon erupt in the civil rights movement, the sense of the, the way the past for the African American community at this moment is constrained, they are constrained by the past, by the legacy of slavery and the legacy of hundreds of years of oppression. There's a cliched saying, those who don't know the past are doomed to repeat it. Um, but that's sort of a simplified uh, understanding. We, we do learn about the past in some sense. Part of that reason, and a very important part of that reason, is so that we don't repeat the mistakes of the past. But also, part of it is to learn the ways in which the past still uh, impinges upon us, the way it still affects us and pressures us, the way that we are still constrained and trapped by the past in ways that we maybe don't even recognize. So now that we've talked a little bit, I've talked about sort of the first half of the journey, and it's after the this memory, uh, uh, this trip into down down memory lane, so to speak, this travel into the past when the narrator, as the narrator calls his youth with Sonny and the development of their relationship over time and how they grew apart um, up until the moment of the beginning of the story itself. 
after that memory um, is the beginning of the narrator's reconciliation. We might say that's the kind of lowest point of the story. The narrator's at his lowest point because all he's thinking about is how did my brother and I come to this point of disjunction? How do we come to this conflict, this separation from one another? So we're at the lowest point. And then it's after that memory, that, that uh, remembering, that the narrator exits that and they start moving towards reconciliation. So some question, one question to ask is, what is the initial vehicle of their reconnection? For the narrator, at least in part, one of the initial reconnections is the death of his daughter named Grace. So the loss of his daughter, he says, makes Sonny's pain real. He says, my own pain made Sonny's pain real to me. It's not until he loses his daughter, Grace. And, of course, Grace there is a uh, religious term. Uh, Grace is a name that has religious connotations, uh, religious overtones. The loss of grace, the loss of God's blessing. It's not until he, uh, he, he reaches that low point that he finally reaches out to Sonny. So there's, but there's still not, uh, uh, it's a sh there's a shared loss there and a certain identification with Sonny. But on the other hand, it's still somewhat self-centered. It's he, he has to think about himself in order to think about Sonny. He's still not, they're still not reconciled. And at that moment, the narrator still hadn't gone far enough, we might say, towards becoming a true brother to Sonny. And as we see, there's a scene, um, the first scene of them listening to music, listening to the uh, gospel singers on the street who are singing and playing music for uh, uh, change to earn money from passersby. Uh, they get into an argument. They get into not not a severe fight, but they get in, get into an argument with each other. So what is the cause of that conflict? If you look back at that scene and think, what is still keeping them apart? And what is the connection between the way they listen to that music and the different things they heard in that music and the argument? And that leads us to the question of then what changes in the final scene? When they go to the nightclub and the narrator finally sees and hears Sonny play with a band. And he, and he hears Sonny um, tentatively explore the piano and ultimately express uh, a play very beautifully, uh, uh, the blues. What is it that has changed for the narrator? What is he, uh, how is it that he's able to understand Sonny differently? What does he hear in Sonny's playing? And how does it express Sonny's experience to the, the narrator in a way that Sonny's words didn't? And this ultimately, I think, is the, the idea that the story is exploring. How one person can, through art and through pain, try to reach beyond their own experience to someone else's, to another person. In this case, from one brother to another how to reach beyond that, the limitations of what you know, to understand another person. And in understanding that other person, you, you also understand yourself better. That relationship through art, the way art brings one to a, a more harmonious, so to speak, uh, which is an appropriate word given the, the subject of the story, a more harmonious union cooperation with another person. Now, let's do a 180-degree pivot to talk about Edgar Allan Poe's The Cask of Amontillado. This is also a first-person narrator, the narrator Montresor, but here it's using the, the limitations of the perspective, the limitations of the first-person perspective in almost the exact opposite way as Sonny's Blues. In a very in, it's the inversion of Sonny's blues. This is what's called uh, a perfect example of what's called an unreliable narrator. A narrator that it, that's a term that I I actually don't really love, uh, but the sense of an unreliable narrator is for some reason we don't trust what they say, and I don't like the term unreliable narrator because I think it's a little too simplistic. Usually, what 
that means when someone calls uh, a character, uh, the narrator of a story, an unreliable narrator. It just means someone who's unsavory, someone we don't like, someone who's a criminal in some way, as Montresor is in this case. The idea is, though, is that the unreliable narrator, we don't trust what they tell us, not so much in that they will lie explicitly about what happened, although sometimes uh, there are narrators that are lying, and, and you can tell in some way or the other that they're lying. But um, it's not so much, I think, of of the that they're lying about the events, but they're lying or deceiving us about the meaning of the events, the significance of the events. Um, their motivations, their inner thoughts, their feelings are suspect in the unreliable narrator. And the reason why um, I don't like necessarily that term then, therefore, is because I don't necessarily think that Montresor is any less reliable than the narrator of Sonny's Blues. Just because the narrator of Sonny's Blues is intending to tell us the truth, we don't get any, there's no reason, I think, to, to believe that the narrator of Sonny's Blues is lying about anything that happened in that story or trying to deceive uh, uh, the, the reader about his experience. He seems to be pretty honest. He's pretty forthright. But that doesn't mean he's telling us the truth. He's still limited by his perspective. He still might be mistaken about what things meant, why things happened in a certain way. He may still in some ways be hiding emotions in the way that we all hide emotions or giving us uh, a certain persona, uh, a perspective, uh, 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 an illusory persona to cover up some secret, cover up some aspect of himself that he doesn't want to reveal. So just because someone's intending to tell the truth doesn't mean that they're not perhaps being deceptive in ways that they don't even realize. And just because a character like Montresor is a narrator who I think very clearly, and there's, there's moments in the story where we can see this, is in some way atten attempting to manipulate the audience, manipulate the person he's speaking to, um, he's telling them the truth, but telling it in a certain way to get to manipulate them to, to think a certain way about it. And that's what makes him unreliable. But I think just because someone's intending to deceive you, that doesn't mean that they don't unintentional, unintentionally reveal things, reveal truths that they, again, may not even be aware of. But in any case, when, when reading a story like The Cask of Amontillado in particular, think about how is it that the narrator attempts to get us on their side? What does the narrator seem to want from us? And um, in what ways do they try to get our, perhaps, our sympathy, our forgiveness, get us to side with them, to agree with them? Um, what is it that Montresor does in this story to try to perhaps get his listener to either, if not necessarily sympathize with him or forgive him, for the murder of Fortunato, at least understand on some sense, uh, on some level, why he did it. What are the things, what are the methods that the, that the narrator tries to use to manipulate us? One of those is the way the story begins quite immediately on a note of intimacy. Talks about how you know me so well, and anyone who knows me as well as you do would know that I couldn't bear the, the insults of someone like Fortunato. So it begins on this note of intimacy, saying, you're someone who knows me so well. You know what I'm like. And by beginning on that note of intimacy, it's, it's an, in some sense an attempt to seduce us, to make us like them, to make us think, this is a person who's my friend, right? Um, just as he did Fortunato, seduce the, the audience in the same way that he seduced Fortunato into following him into the catacombs. And, of course, another important thing about this opening note of intimacy is that it makes it clear that the character of Montresor is speaking to someone. He's not writing this. He's not saying you, the audience in the 21st century uh, of English students in, at A&M Kingsville who are reading this story, you know me so well. The character of Montresor is speaking to some fictional character within his world. And so that raises a, the question of why would you tell this story? What might be the purpose of telling someone the story of how you killed someone else, how you murdered in cold blood someone else in a very cruel way by trapping them 
underground, walling them up to starve to death in a, 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 a hole in the wall. Why might he be doing that, and to whom might he be saying this, uh, reciting this tale? I don't think necessarily the answers that it's so important to answer, well, he's speaking to this specific person, he's doing this specific thing, but they help us again to understand what is it that the narrator wants, and how does the narrator try to uh, uh, achieve his want? How does he try to reach his desire? From the very beginning of the story, we might say that it's about, at least in part, about false appearances or about paying attention to the wrong signs, to the wrong things. Montresor appears as a friend to Fortunato. He presents himself as Fortunato's friend. He behaves uh, in, in an uh, intimate manner. He puts his arm around him, treats him as though they're, they're close, speaks to him in a kind voice. But beneath that friendly air is this hatred, this submerged desire to punish Fortunato, to wreak his revenge on Fortunato. And Fortunato makes the mistake of being seduced by the appearance, by the behavior of his friend. Ironically here, their costumes that they're wearing, remember that this is during Carnival, during Fat Tuesday, uh, so this is during a time of celebration where people dress up in, in costumes and dance and, and uh, partake in, in excessive drinking and partying and so forth. Ironically, the costumes that they're revealing, if Fortunato had been in some sense even more superficial and just looked at what they were wearing, their costumes ironically reveal the truth of their characters uh, or their fates in this story. Fortunato is dressed like a fool. He's dressed like a court jester. And Fortunato is the fool of the story. He is the one who is fooled, right? Uh, he's tricked by Montresor. On the other hand, Montresor is wearing a long, heavy, dark cloak and has the appearance of like a Grim Reaper type figure, a, a figure of death and doom. And that is what he brings. He brings death to Fortunato. And there are other um, elements of the story, other moments of of, of things with complicated appearances where the truth, the reality is hard to, uh, to tell from just what we see. For example, motto, uh, Montresor's motto and crest, right? The crest of the foot stepping down on the snake, the snake biting the heel of the foot. And the question that we ask there is, well, which is Montresor? Which is the Montresor family? Is Montresor the family that's squashing the snake or is Montresor the family, is the Montresor the snake biting back the heel that, is, that has squashed them, that is attacking, uh, pay, getting revenge on their, the party that injured them. The motto of Montresor's family is none provokes me with impunity. That is, no one, no one hurts me without getting paid back. So in some sense, Montresor could be either the foot or the uh, or the snake, right? Uh, Montresor's family can be either one. And Fortunato makes the mistake of thinking, he says, oh, that's a great, great crest, great motto, how wonderful. Uh, Fortunato makes the mistake of not understanding that it applies to him, that when Montresor says, no one provokes me with impunity, he's saying that directly to Fortunato. Another complicated set of, of images in the story is Montresor's home. On the outside, he has this uh, manor, this, this great house that is a sign of wealth, a sign of nobility, a sign of his family's good name. But we learn in passing that Montresor's family has fallen on hard times, that he is no longer wealthy. They have a noble name, but not much else. They don't necessarily have the wealth or power to back up the nobility of that name. And that's matched by what is underneath the palazzo, what is underneath the home, the catacombs, the graves, the dead. Beneath the appearance of wealth, beneath the appearance of nobility is death. The remnants of the past, the remnants of the lost glory. That's all that Montresor has left. And so this takes us to the central and most significant symbol image in the story, and that is 
the cask of Amontillado, the el the uh, uh, item in the title. This crate of very fine wine that, that Montresor claims that he has, that he tells Fortunato about, and that's how he seduces Fortunato, tricks him into uh, coming to the, the catacombs and ultimately leading him down to his death. He knows that Fortunato likes to impress people with his knowledge of wine, so he says, well, I'm going over to this other guy's house. And Fortunato says, that he doesn't know anything about wine. Let me taste it. I want to taste it. I want to try this great, wonderful w wine. And, what, of course, what we know is that it's not actually there. There is no cask, right? So Fortunato desires something that's not there. He, ha he desires an illusion, an something that's not real. And ultimately, what does he get? He gets death. The desire for pleasure leads only to death. And this echoes many of the other uh, ironic images in the story. Like, for again, for example, the primary one being the catacombs beneath the palazzo, the death beneath the image of, um, of beauty and wealth and nobility. So thinking about that, that issue of desire for pleasure, desire for worldly satisfaction, desire for just desire in general, ultimately only leads us to death. It leads us all into the catacombs. Keeping that in mind, let's think about the end of the story. Fortunato is walled up in uh, a, a crevice in the catacombs. The narrator walls him up and leaves him there to die, um, undisturbed for 50 years, as we find out. Now, of course, Fortunato's dead. No one's going to survive for 50 years uh, in, a, in a hole in the ground with no food or water. Uh, but there is a sort of, um, well, if you, you've never been back, how do you really know sort of thing. There's a kind of Schrodinger's cat element here. Is Fortunato dead or not? Um, not in the literal sense, but just in the sense of so hidden, thinking about hidden beneath the, the house of Montresor is this skeleton. He has quite literally a skeleton in his closet um, or a skeleton in his, in his basement, as the, as the case may be, uh, that's, that's been there waiting, sitting, decaying for 50 years. So we might ask ourselves what Montresor's goal at the beginning of the story was revenge, right? That's what he wanted from Fortunato. He wanted to revenge himself upon Fortunato. Did he succeed? What is Montresor's attitude at the end of the story? Notice how he's a little bit, it seems, um, a, little, a little ambiguous, a li little ambivalent in the moment when he recalls the moment of walling Fortunato up and the dampness uh, the, that, his heart, that made his heart grow sick. He calls out one last time for Fortunato, hears no response, and gets this moment of sickness. And this is presumably when he would feel as a, as a revenger, as a vengeful person, this is when he'd feel most triumphant because he's won. So what is his attitude at that moment? What is it that made his heart feel sick? Was it a realization of the horror of what he's done? Was it perhaps wanting to hear Fortunato suffer more, wanting to, to torture him even further? It raises the question of what is the purpose of revenge? Is the purpose to destroy the other person? To rid yourself of them? To torture them? If you still remember the person who you've gotten your reve revenge on, if you still live with that anger and hatred, if you still even perhaps exult in that anger and hatred, have you truly succeeded in your vengeance? In some way, we might think about Montresor, compare Montresor's quest to Fortunato's quest. Fortunato wants something that's not there. He desires something that is illusory the cask of Amontillado that doesn't actually exist. Does Montresor also want something that doesn't exist? And where does his desire take him? What sort of death does it lead him to? And that leads us, I think, to the last question, going back to the issue of, as I said at the beginning of the story, Montresor uh, 
opens it on a moment of intimacy, intimacy, saying, you know me so well. You know my heart. You know the inner workings of my soul. And at the end of the story, he reveals that all these things he's been talking about happened 50 years before. Fortunato's body had been uh, uh, decaying in the ground for 50 years undisturbed. So presumably no one has heard this story. No one knows about this. No one knew what happened to Fortunato. This is the first time Montresor is revealing the, the truth of what has happened. And the final words of the story are, or may he rest in peace. So who is he telling this to? And why would he be telling it? And what is the attitude? What is the tone that he's t in which he's telling this story? Um, does he feel guilty? Is he telling this story as a sort of confession? That's been one uh, uh, theory that's been offered, that he's speaking perhaps a deathbed confession to a priest who is going to absolve him, the priest that has been his confessor for years, so who knows his soul. And so this is perhaps him freeing himself of his guilt. On the other hand, might he be, even if he is confessing, might he be getting a certain thrill out of telling the story? Might there be something boastful about, let me tell you just how I did it sort of thing? That's kind of cliche that we see in movies, the murderer or the serial killer who loves to tell their, even though they're caught, they love to, uh, they're not, they don't feel sorry about what they've done and they love describing to the cops all the horrible things that they've done. Right? Is there a sense in which Montresor is getting perhaps a, a bit of a thrill in telling this horrible story and maybe horrifying this person that he's telling it to? Or is it maybe both? Might he feel both guilty and a little thrilled by what he's done? Might he recognize it as a horrible, evil act, yet still feel a kind of uh, 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 rush at the power, at the fact that he did kill this man that had wronged him, that he did get him back in some sense? I think even though Montresor is a murderer, is a villain, he, uh, he might be that complicated. I don't think people are as easily characterized as good or evil a as we often do in stories. People aren't just good or evil. People don't, and people who are evil certainly don't think of themselves as evil. People are complicated. And I think apart from your serial killers, apart from um, some of your truly unrepentant, awful people, I think even some of the most uh, vicious criminals feel a, at least somewhat conflicted about some of the things they've done. Even while they might get a little thrill out of telling the stories of the old days back when they used to do things that they, that they would never, of course, do now. So what do we get out of reading a story like this? I think the benefits, so to speak, of reading a story like Sonny's Blues are fairly obvious. That is, it's a story of a good person trying to overcome their flaws and, and reconnect with a member of their family. And it's a story that, despite the suffering, despite the pain in it, despite the trauma in it, despite the darkness in it, does have a kind of uh, uplifting essence to it. While on the other hand, Cask of Amontillado is a uh, character that we can't really, I don't think, get much from in terms of moral lessons. And certainly, we don't want to promote being murderers. I think the average person is not going to identify with Montresor, though, the way the one might identify with the, um, the character of uh, the narrator of Sonny's Blues. But what do we get out of reading a story like Cask of Amontillado? Well, at least one theory is that we, we get a sort of vicarious thrill, and we get to sort of purge our negative emotions, purge our negative desires. Why do we like watching horror movies? Well, the, the thrill of being scared and then being relieved. We get that anxiety and then the release of anxiety feels wonderful. Uh, why do we watch boxing or violent sports? Because we vicariously live through the, the thrill of that, that violence. That's why we watch violent movies, action movies. Even if we would never do something like that or not capable of that kind of violence, Something in us, something in our animal lizard brain gets a, gets a rush out of witnessing it. So it's a way to purge those emotions. We experience, in them, we experience in them through art, through movies, TV shows, rather than going out and actually doing it. 
So perhaps that's one thing that we get from a story like Cask of Amontillado. We get to experience the depths of that desire for revenge. We get to travel with someone in their mind into the darkest, deepest parts of their soul, the catacombs beneath the, the palazzo, the, the dark, hidden hatreds and evils and, and desires that are within even the most saintly human being. And then we see the experience of what it would be like to actually act on those desires. We've all felt the desire to get back at someone. Oh, I wish I could ruin that person's life the way they've screwed me over. But we get to experience, what would that actually be like? What would it feel like if you did get to ruin that person's life? If you did steal their girlfriend the way they stole yours? If you did kill them because they wronged you? Would it really be satisfying? So we get, perhaps in one sense, we get to have our cake and eat it too. We get to try on being a bad guy and hopefully ultimately learn that that's not the way we want to behave. Perhaps that's not the best path. That's not the desire that we should pursue because it doesn't really lead us anywhere. Just a thought. Okay, that will be the end of my presentation on first-person narratives in Sunny's Blues and the Cask of Amontillado. If you have any questions, please get in touch. Questions or comments, please get in touch. Happy to hear from you. Otherwise, I will see you in my next presentation, and I wish you the day you wish yourselves. Take care.